Lately we have been talking about being revived and revival, and I believe that this morning we are going to continue on that particular subject because it is a very important subject. I believe that the Lord Jesus is coming back, and before he is coming back, there must come a revived church. I don't want him to come and find a church that is asleep, but I want him to come and find a church that is revived. I don't go by a lot of books. I only go by what I have seen, and therefore some of the uh, remarks that I will make, they are things that I have seen in my life and through the time of my life. It's as you can see, my life has been long, and, uh, but it's been long and well. I am full and, uh, of many days, and those full days are uh, filling the, the, my soul because I know that I had a good life in the Lord. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, my sin that is not got anything to do with revival, but I think that it will, will come to that point. Book of Romans, chapter 5, from verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into grace, wherein we stand, rejoice, hope, and glory to God. And not only so, but we only glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience works hope. There are three things which I want you to know this in this particular part of the scripture. One is that we are uh, justified by faith, and therefore, that is by the uh, t that justification will bring in our heart and in our mind peace. We must have peace in our mind, in our heart, because we are living in days where peace doesn't seem to be uh, the the talk of the day. All we hear in the news is war, war, rumors of war rumors of wars. But we are believers, and therefore, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are justified and living in a different world where we, through the wars and rumors of wars, we are still experiencing peace in our heart and in our mind. So we must experience peace, one, two. By whom also we have access by faith, into the what? The grace, the grace in wherewith we stand, rejoice, hope, and we glory to the glory of God. The next thing is that we must rejoice in is that we believe in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember the days where every time you do something that is wrong, somebody comes and knocks you on the head. And if you've done something, they keep you knocking and knocking and knocking until you disappear under the water. But we are Christians now, and therefore we are justified by faith, and we believe strongly into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that every morning when I get up and I say, Lord, this is a new day, and in this new day I am going to trust into your grace, into my life, so that I can live another 24 hours. Isn't that so? That's the only way that I can live. If I live in my own works, in my own things, I can't do it. But through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I can. Third, and not only so, but we glory into something which I do not like. Nobody likes tribulation. But unfortunately, we are living in the world and tribulation are upon us day after day, hour after hour. It is, seems impossible in this world with our worldly, fleshly body to live 
without having any tribulation. And I'm not talking about the tribulation of mind where we have those thoughts in our minds which keep us away and keep us awake through the night. But I'm talking to the tribulation of our body as well. I have to face that I'm getting old. And by getting old, therefore, my body is, is wearing out. And because my body is wearing out, I go through tribulation, my friend. You might think because I jump up and down, I'm okay, I have no problem. But I do have a problem. That problem is not caused by God, but is caused by the flesh and the body in which I am investing at this time. The day is going to come when this body will have no saying upon me anymore. This body will have nothing to say to me anymore. And the sooner the better, as soon as the cloud will burst in the heaven, and the trumpet will sound, and the dead thing I shall rise, and I quote this scripture so many times, my body will be revitalized by the power of the Holy Spirit, and this flesh will have no say whatsoever anymore for the rest of eternity. That is the grace of God. Wonderful, beautiful. Okay, that was only the beginning, my friend. We haven't got into it yet. Nevertheless, if you feel that you have pains or tribulation, just glory, glory in them. For God is using them somehow to keep us in touch with him. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter, four, chapter 3, verse 4, it says like this, To everything there is a season, and there is a time for every purpose under the heavens. Time. Time. Time is something that we do not have. And the older you get, and the more you realize that you do not have time. When you are young, you just wish that who knows what was going to happen. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you're always waiting for tomorrow. When you're getting old, the only tomorrow you're waiting is eternity. And that is good. Time, it is, belongs to men. Time, it is not, it is God's prerogative to, to, uh, to use for the well-being and for, the, uh, for men. God lives in eternity. God is eternal, and eternity is God. Before everything ever happened, He was there. Before everything was ever built, He was there. Whenever everything is going to pass away, He was still with there. I firmly convinced that time began in the, in the uh, Garden of Eden, the day that Adam and Eve committed uh, uh, disregard to God's law. I believe that that's when time actually started. God lives in eternity, but time, it is God's prerogative. He uses for the goodness and for the grace of man. You find in the scripture something like saying if the people which are the people my people, which are called on my name, if they pray and repent, I will pass away. It passing away, it means that that generation will not go through those troubles and problems. But those, those things that have to happen, they, are hap they, they have to happen. They are set in the heaven to the uh, time of uh, uh, through eternity. Now let us talk about revival for a moment, for I believe that revival, it is God's prerogative for the church. Church must live in revival. Unfortunately, because we are made of flesh and blood, we are going through season and time, but God wants the church to be in revival, because God does not sleep, net is slumber, but He's always awake and ready to, the, to do the job at any moment, at any time. He doesn't sleep. Revival is a burning fire 
But that fire which is left unattended, it becomes ashes and dies. I was thinking about this, and I thought about when I was younger, the young, my kids, they used to, get, to take us to the campfire. We went down somewhere, we put a tent on. I don't know why I spent so much money to fix the house and then enjoy going and sleeping in a tent. I, I, I really don't know. We buy the best stove and uh, oven, ovens that uh, uh, the market can give us, and then we go and put some fire, uh, and, and we cook on a fire somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I don't know why. But anyway, young people like that, and so we had to go with them, and we did. And uh, like it or not, I slept on a tent a few times, a couple of times. No, maybe more. I don't know, but not that many. And I was thinking about a fire. The first thing that we did when we arrived on a campfire, we, uh, to, the, to the camp, we, uh, we set up the tent. Then we set up all of the, uh, the beds and everything ready for the night. And then we started thinking about cooking. And therefore, somebody had to start the fire. And we started that fire. And uh, we had to go around, pick up the wood somewhere, and then bring it together, put the fire underneath, and blow there until you had a good size, uh, sizable fire, and so that you can start cooking your uh, marshmallow, or I mean, uh, <clears throat> the steak and the uh, chops and whatever it comes, and the sausages and whatever it came with. Kids, I don't understand them. Anyway, you can have a nice piece of steak, but they want sausages on the fire. Okay. But anyway, uh, the fire, so the fire keeps going, and you have a beautiful fire, a nice flame coming out of there. You start cooking, you get nice and satisfied. And then before you know, the night is over, the night is coming, and therefore you're going to go to bed. Now, what happens to the fire when you're going to sleep? It dies out. When you wake up in the morning, you look where you had a beautiful fire the night before. All you can see are ashes. There are ashes. Now, it is my job. It is my duty. Well, not mine, it was my kids. To have that fire revived. And to have that fire revived, they had to go out in the bush, pick up some wood, bring it in, blow on the ashes, put the, fire, put the wood in top of it, and that fire start catching up again. And it reminds me of the church. The church is in the same way. For some reason, somehow, the time goes by, we have uh, the night comes, and we get restful, we get at peace, we don't think about the fire anymore. The fire that we thought about when we got saved and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we wanted to go out and get people, and we got to tell everybody there was a fire burning within our soul. Then we fell asleep because the night came, and when we fell asleep, that fire was not there anymore. To revive the fire, we need the wood. Without the wood, the fire doesn't go up. You can blow on the ashes as much as you want, but they're ashes, and ashes will remain. You can come to church every time you want, every day, every Sunday, and you can come up here and bring nobody and peep, uh, talk to nobody and see nobody. You come as an ash. Neil blows on those ashes. You go home, but they're still ashes. There is no fire. Fire come when those ashes get so in too sweet burning that they want the wood. And those who are around that have pushed that fire, the fire is the fire of the Holy Ghost, the church are the people who will go around looking for the sticks and for the wood in order to bring into the fire. The Holy Spirit is the wind that blows upon that fire. And before you know, you have a revival. 
And early in the morning, when the morning came, and the kids went come in with the wood, and the fire, and the and and we were blowing generally blowing on the on the ashes. The fire began to grow, and before you know, there was a nice big fire bonfire, and the people from around the camp they would come and say, "So early you have the fire. Give me some of that fire. I want to start a fire in my own tent as well." My friend, when the Holy Spirit comes and blows, and we start bringing the, uh, the, the woods from outside, and the Holy Spirit starts blowing, others will come from the Sunshine Coast, and from the rest of the uh, Queensland state, and from the rest of Australia, and they want that fire because they want to start fire in their own tent, which is their own church. But fire has to be built up. We have to build it up. We must do something. I talked about what I know and what I went through. But through the early stages of my life, the church in Italy became ashes. The reason why they became ashes is because there was a harsh persecution upon them. The church had to fall on the ground and therefore fall asleep. You could not see the fire of the Holy Spirit without putting your life into danger, to death and prison. Therefore, the church went into ashes. And for 10 years, the church was on the underground and it became only dying ashes. I remember from time to time, those ashes were, the Holy Spirit would blow upon those ashes somewhere down in the cave where the people would come together to worship God and to pray. The Holy Spirit will come, will blow upon those ashes, and you have some eruptions here and there, but you couldn't go out and get the wood to feed those ashes, and therefore they became ashes again. Reminds me of the church that we come again and again, but unless we bring the wood, the, fire, the, the, uh, the ashes will fire up, but then we'll die again. Until the day. The end of World War II, when the persecution was, went over, when the people who went to jail were freed because of a new law that came into the country, where the people who were sentenced to death, they were not, they were delivered because, the power, because of a new law that came into the country. The ashes began to burn alive. It was something in the heart of people that wanted to spare with the, that wanted to share with other people. And I remember as being just a young boy, when meetings were held somewhere in the corner, in the street somewhere, and all you need is a guitar and an accordion, and hundreds of people will come because they were hungry after the war, hungry for peace and for grace, and you start telling them that God will give them that hunger and that praise. They begin to get hungry in their soul, and they will come into the meeting. And I have seen the church starting, 30 people, from 30 to 50, from 50 to 100, from 100 to 500, to 500 to 1,000, from 1,000 to 2,000. My brother, my sister, whatever you bring the wood, the church will grow. And whatever they bring the wood, the flame will go up and the church will grow. That is revival in my book, my friend. Revival is not coming to church, jumping up and down and go home. And then say, that's it for me. I've done my job today. The time is tired. Time has come for preachers just to stand up and say, no longer. I'm getting old and there is not much more that I can do. If I can stand here for half an hour, you can stand here for half an hour. If I can still get anointed by the power and the Spirit of God, even though I am old, I know that you can get fired up by the power and the Spirit of God. The church will not grow unless we bring the fire, my brother Peter. 
Unless the church will not grow. Unless we go out in the outskirts and we go and get those people to come. I don't mean go and people grab people by the neck and say, come to church or what. Those days are over. Yes, there is revival. Yes, maybe the Lord is waiting to make the trumpet of heaven sound because he is waiting for the church to get revival. You see, if God had preordained in eternity that when he come, there will be a glorious church filled and filled and filled of the Holy Spirit and power, that is what is going to be. The point is that God cannot come because the church is not filled with the Holy Spirit and power. Because the church is not revived in the way it should be with that fire of the Holy Spirit and Christ cannot come. My friend, God lives in eternity. We live in time. We can change the time as the time goes by. We can change it by our prayer. We can change it by our doing. We can change by our doing. We cannot change eternity, but we can change time. So instead of complaining that things are going wrong into the world, instead of complaining that we somehow we cannot live any longer because of this and because of that, there is a lot of pers- a lot of tribulation going around the world. Instead of complaining, it is time that we blow the fire, the ashes in our heart, and let's start moving so that God will come back and take us away from all of this. Time is our prerogative. If the people who are called by my name, if they pray, oh yes, I can change things. What does he do? He change eternity? Of course not. He doesn't change eternity, but he changes time. He changes time. Instead of this week, it is next week. Instead of this generation, it is next generation. So when we are waiting, the church has to be filled with the power of God. Then I saw people going out. Then, of course, I start growing up, and they're growing up and getting to age, and and I had to start moving out as well, like everybody else was. I remember just a couple of kids. We get on a bicycle. We go to a town somewhere about 20, 30 kilometers away from the center, we go down to that area, we get a, an, accordion, an, 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 an accordion somewhere and a guitar, and we go out in that, in, in, in that town, we stand in a corner somewhere, we start singing and we start playing the guitar, the people start coming from all over the place, the Italian people are very nosy. And when it comes to music, they start running all over the place. And so they come, and by the time they came, they start listening. And when you have a nice group over there, you stand up and you start telling them what God can do for them. Bring fire. Bring revive. Bring, bring the wood so that the fire will go on. That's how the church grew. It didn't get overnight, 1,000 people overnight. You didn't get 2,000 people overnight. It's impossible. You come to the city of Rome, now we have five churches, and some of them are 2,000 people. They didn't come, they didn't happen just because they happened. It happened because we were going out and getting the wood in order to keep the fire going. And I believe that if we as people, no matter what is our age, we ask God to give us, to, uh, to help us, to be able to open door and to bring people and let people know about the grace of God, God will do exactly that. I said it before, just a handful of people. Uh, Today, of course, Italy's got the second largest church, Pentecostal church, second only, the 
biggest, largest church, Pentecostal church, second only to the Catholic church. Now, I can tell you some few things that happened while well, those things happened, but I'm not going to. My friend, we want a revival. Revival can happen, but we must bring the fire. We have to fan, 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 fan. So the English language is very funny, my friend. Tell you what. You say one thing, but you actually mean another. You think you are saying one thing, but that word means not something else. And you have to be, watch, be very careful what you're saying, because those words sometimes they mean something that you don't want it to mean. Yeah. You had one word for three, four, five different things. You know what the marriage law problem is right now? Because... The language is confusing, very confusing. I was talking to somebody and they said, well, maybe I should vote yes. He said, after all, if they love each other, sure. So I want to marry my dog because I love my dog. Oh, my God. You see how confusing it is? I'm so glad that when we go to heaven, we speak Italian. <laughs> At least it's a language I understand. <laughs> there is a word for everything and everything for a word. <laughs> and so it's, uh, is it much easier to go on? There is no confusion there. Revival is what we need. We need revival for two different things. One, we need revival because we want to see people get the grace of God and get saved by the power of God. We love people. We want them to get saved. We don't want them to go to hell because they will go to hell unless they get saved. And so we want revival for that. The second thing, we want revival because we want Jesus to come back. Please, I want Jesus to come back. I want Jesus to come back. I want him to come. If he comes tonight, I'll be very happy. If he comes tomorrow, I'll be very happy. He hasn't told me when he's going to come. But he's going to come because it's written to the books of eternity that he's going to do it. And he's going to do it. And therefore, there is no way of changing it. But that time is our prerogative. I want him to come tomorrow so that I get away from all my problems and my trouble. I don't have this lumbago, or whatever you call it, up here that doesn't make you walk when you want to walk. You, you have a straight head, and they are headed, thinking straight, that all the time, not just some time, but all the time. So I want him to come. I want him to come. The sooner the better. But unless we get a revival, my friend, we are only delaying the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that I made something clear this morning. I hope I don't go for a lot of things, but I hope that you have understood what I am trying to tell you. What I'm telling you is that the prerogative of every, that I want the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. And he cannot come back unless the church get revived and filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Spirit who is presenting a church before Him without spot and without wrinkle. It is the Spirit who is going to do that kind of work and that job. And without we have Him, we can do nothing. So let us fan the flame. Let us fan the flame through the ashes of our life. And let us start beginning to bring fruit for making the fire grow for the kingdom of God. Let us stand for a minute, shall we? I want this morning to start a new day.
and say, Lord, you open the doors of my life and the doors of my day so that I can meet somebody somewhere that I can bring him from the highway of the world into the byways of the kingdom of God. This is what I want to do. What do you want to do?